June 24th in Capitol Park, South Africa. Here on the outskirts of Pretoria, you'll find a cluster of classic railway buildings and train sheds, the home of Rubbles Rail. I've dreamed of doing a hunting trip by train since I first went on safari 20 years ago. Rovos Rail is considered the most luxurious train in the world, with first-class service and accommodations, but they offer first-class wing shooting as well. So with old friends and new, I await departure for perhaps the most classic way to see this great continent as I climb aboard the Rovos Rail. Capitol Park serves as a private station and headquarters for Rovos Rail. Those colonial-style buildings lay in disrepair for many years until Rohan Vos, the owner of Rovos Rail, assumed a long-term lease on the property in the late 1980s and began refurbishing and revitalizing the rail yard. This is the departure and arrival for all Rovos Rail trains, office space for the 300-plus employees of Rovos Rail, and perhaps most dramatically, the maintenance and repair yard for one of the world's biggest collections of steam locomotives. We refurb all our own carriages. We buy old carriages from the railways, and we have a, an entire team that creates what you've seen on the inside of the train. We have the full operations team at Capital Park train station. We have our marketing team, reservations team, and it is a full working station that we do all our main departures from. I first heard about the Robust Rail years ago, and the more I looked at brochures and saw pictures when I came over here, I thought, wouldn't that be fun to do as a bird shooting safari? And I was surprised at how many people had thought about doing it, too. So when I first said I was going to do it, I had a number of my friends that said, I'd like to go. Really a big thanks to uh, Tony from Under Wild Skies. Uh, this is a fantastic talk that he's organized, so I'm sure it's going to be a great adventure for all of you. Eric will keep you up to date on the train as to what your itinerary is and what to expect. Um, right, let's get you on board so we can get the train out um, in time for your 11 o'clock departure. After a glass of champagne and a brief welcome speech, the guests are set for departure. A one-of-a-kind journey by steam engine to the main spur. A steam locomotive takes you out of the yard and you hook up with a diesel later on, but you get the flavor of what that sort of train travel would have been like. Please make sure that you have the correct ammunition for your gun. We really do not want to mix 12 and 20 bore ammunition in a shotgun. After a safety talk from Rovos Rail professional hunter Dave Lincoln, the group relaxes on the train before the shooting gets underway. We really are a mobile five-star safari camp. That, that is the reality. The standards that are maintained on the train are some of the best in the world. It's difficult to convey to people how special an experience this really is, because it is so totally unique. From the moment you set foot in Capitol Park, Pretoria, South Africa, you are transported back in time. An old steam engine sits on the tracks, and behind it, the pride of Africa. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Rovos Rail. Rovos Rail is really a palace on wheels your compartment is really a quite substantial room which you would have in a hotel with a double bed with a bar fridge with your own private bathroom all this on a train within the limitations of a train so a lot of things happening behind the scenes um, food gets prepared whilst guests are off the train rooms get cleaned laundry gets done a lot of aspects that obviously guests don't see it just happens on board this train is a section where you have washing machines and you have got laundry staff. And of course, the laundry at a five-star level is free. So your laundry gets given to your hostess. She hands it over to the laundry girls. And a couple of days later, your laundry arrives freshly ironed and clean. You've got the cars that the shooting guests are staying in. But you've also got train staff. You've got trained maintenance staff that travel with you to make sure you know, that anything mechanically is going wrong, what it is and how it can be fixed. You've got a gun room that locks. You've got an ammunition room that locks. You've got two PHs, 
a historian and a musician there. The historian, Nicholas, who's been with the company for 28 years, has a lot of knowledge about South Africa and African countries. And then a musician, obviously having a musician on the train is always good to entertain the guests in the evenings. It's always nice to come back and be pampered. And that's why we have a hairstylist on the train. When you come back to the train, you clean up and dress for dinner. Now, some of the train trips, dinner is black tie, it's very formal. We were not gonna do black tie after we'd been out shooting all day, so we decided that we'd wear sport coats for dinner and not coat and tie, and the women were more casual as well. Now, when you see how tiny is the kitchen, the galley of this train, it's minute, and yet they produce four courses per meal of truly five-star standard. We do not have Wi-Fi on the train. We believe in good conversation and serious drinking on Rough Australia. Very relaxed, very laid back. If you want to come on a holiday that uh, you actually feel that you are on holiday, this is definitely something that you, you have to do. It has to be on your bucket list. You generally travel at night, and that's so it's while you're eating, while you're sleeping, but you're moving to a different venue almost every day. It's a fun way to see South Africa. It's a fun way to go to different venues and enjoy the travel in between. The staff on the train are staff members that really love working with people. You must really, really love what you do to, to be in a confined space and be away from home for such a long time. Without the staff that we have on the train, this company is really nothing. And the owner realizes that, and he thanks us, and he looks after us. And I think that is what staff appreciate, and that's why they enjoy doing what they're doing. To begin disembarking for the day's activities afield, Rovos Rail offers the non-shooter a variety of day trips during the journey. City tours, old Boer War battlefields, and that most African of experiences, a traditional safari game drive. Today they are off to a place called Makulu Safaris, where they will enjoy a bit of a talk on lion hunting in South Africa specifically. Here, here. Whoa. Here he comes. Magnificent sizes. Oh. The lions they have at this property are not hunted, but what this odor does is he does a lion feed. Oh. They will then have lunch and do a bit of a game drive, and they have the big five available at Makulu Safaris and return back to the train. At Makalu Private Game Reserve, guests experience African wildlife up close and personal. With breeding herds of roan, sable, black-faced impala, and other plains game, there's even a chance to glimpse one of Africa's big five, the Cape Buffalo. They're checking us out. <laughs> With the guns set to disembark at Bloemfontein Station, the game viewing will turn toward the skies, with dove and rock pigeons intent on humbling even the most dialed-in shooter. From the train, the shooting guests are taken by private coach to the shooting location on private land, farmland, outside of the city of Bloemfontein in South Africa. Thank you, sir. And the guns draw their peg numbers as in the sort of traditional fashion, are then deployed to the, the actual butts, which are portable metal structures with camouflage type shade netting surrounding each butt. And inside the butt, they have a little stool and a cooler with cold drinks and et cetera, and of course, ammunition and their guns. We're here outside of Bloemfontein, and we're gonna shoot dove and pigeons on this cornfield today. And I brought my Holland Royal Paradox, and I've shot ducks with it, I've shot all sorts of birds with it, killed a blessed buck with it last time I was over. And so I'm gonna shoot dove with it, a few ducks. It might be time to start. Down it goes. We got coming right here. Tail feathering, which means too far back. David Gardner is a Nebraskan, lifelong hunter, good friend of mine. 
He and his wife, Rosemary, with us. We were over here the first part of the month on a separate trip, so we decided to stay on and do the train with Tony. So we've been here for the month. I think I hit that one. Sal's a good friend of mine, too, from Braves. Hunting buddy. One coming high here. When we got the dove field, there were a few dove in there. Nothing really much happening. But as the day wore on, more and more and more came. And they told us that would happen. And just after lunch, it heated up and stayed really exciting until we stopped about, I think, 4.30, 4.45. Thank you, sir. You've got to train a bunch of your friends. It makes things a lot easier. Nicely done. We're having a great time. The train's phenomenal. And the uh, food's un unbelievably good. So we're all going to go home with more baggage than we came with. Thank you very much. You know, it took a little while to kind of get wired back into uh, shooting doves and rock pigeon. You know, they're, they're highly maneuverable. And then after a while, I realized that, that um, whatever lead you thought you had, it wasn't enough, <laughs> you know? So I just put in a little extra lead, and you wind up going down like that guy. Well, they're certainly getting plenty of shooting this afternoon. Nicely done. I enjoy this. This has been a great day. Yes. The weather is perfect. The beaters are working. A little high shot there. That's OK. Bob and Alice Horseman. Bob has done many, many things in life. But at 82, is still one of the fastest I've seen with a shotgun. And Allison's a competitive play shooter. Nope. Maybe. Nope. All right. I'm dead. Far out. A little far out, but. I had a hot and cold, streaky day. Made some circus shots. Missed some layups. But as the great Jonathan Winters said, only the truly mediocre are always at their best. After a blistering day in the dove fields, the group moves on to new shooting grounds and the chance for an even more challenging bird, rock pigeon. These are the aerial acrobats of the farm fields, sure to humble even the most dialed-in shotgunner with speed and agility like few other birds. Yeah, the rock pigeons are considerably larger than a Cape turtle dove and solid flying birds in flocks, big flocks, 50 to 60 birds in a flock. And it appears as though they are relatively easy shooting until the first shot is fired. And then they flare off and swerve all over the place. Very, very acrobatic birds and exceedingly challenging. Or a new field, new area. Traveled a little bit last night. And we got a, you know, a pretty good breeze, about 10, 15 miles an hour. And they are smoking and burning coming through here. And this is a really nice hunting gun. It's a Blazer F-16. As you can see, you know, beautiful gun, beautiful wood, all the good Blazer features. And I really like that kind of forearm. It's, everybody has their own taste, but I don't like a big, wide, fat forearm. I love those sneak, sneak attacks from behind. And they got that, that little breeze on them, and they are smoking and burning. I've got two down out there from that, but I've missed as many, so. Well, you can watch them. Here come three. And watch when someone shoots. Watch how they divert. See how they drop and speed up and turn sharply? That was not spectacular. What happens if there's a flock of them coming towards you and someone tries to take a high shot, 
He could scare all the birds off, they, or certainly make them more difficult shots. Oh. Man, come in and try to get I think I sped him up and missed him the time. They're smaller than an American homing pigeon or the pigeons you see in our cities. Very fast. And they are, you know, I wouldn't say humiliating, but challenging. This is sporty. Coming from all sides, all speeds, all altitudes. They've got great reflexes. It is very challenging, in fact, and virtually every client who comes out here and shoots rock pigeons with us is pleasantly surprised at how challenging they are. And the beauty is that there are vast numbers of these pigeons, literally in their hundreds of thousands, congregating on all of this farmland where there is such an abundance of a variety of feed. Uh, corn, sunflowers, uh, peanuts, groundnuts, um, alfalfa, etc. And from the farmer's point of view, the more we take down, the better. We got up just enough. Guests absolutely love it. They really do. Many, many hours of very pleasurable shooting. This is going to work. <laughs> that was a gift. Clubhouse pear. To my head quickly. I was doing my victory roll still. Rockies will get inside your head. They're very fast. And just like Dove, they're changing direction. And on the second day, we had a pretty steady wind, you know, 15 to 20 gusting to 30. And when they would come downwind, it was, you had to start leaving before you saw them. Two for two. I'm back. Momentary little bunch working out front, out front. You know, I've always wanted to do this train trip. You have expectations and dreams about it. And I gotta tell you, it's everything I thought it would be and more. It really is just a pleasant, lovely day just being out here. And you know, for most of us, you know, being on the bird hunt's a nice experience, but pulling the trigger is the last part of it. It's just being outside, being with good friends, and uh, enjoying the outdoors and nature. And if you actually pull the trigger and get something, that's kind of nice. But uh, all of the other benefits of being outdoors and being a sport hunter, uh, that far outweighs the part of just taking any bird. An African wing shoot is one of the most underrated aspects of a modern day safari, with multiple species and stunning habitat. Bird shooting in Africa offers a welcome change of pace in the bush. For now, I am lulled by the sound of rail cars chugging along through the Africa first line. With the trough, please. The ducks are already flying, so you can start shooting as, as soon as you, you are able to see them. Afterwards, we would have a little breakfast at the river, continental breakfast. We transport the guests from the train very, very early of a morning, well before sunrise. They are taken to the chosen location where butts have been pre-built. In fact, the guests are often led to their individual butts by torchlight. It's still that dark. And then we wait until first light, and then the, the ducks start flying over. Naturally flighted ducks typically flying um, parallel to this river system, the Vaal River. We're on our third day of shooting, and this morning we're out the river back here and some little ponds around, and we're gonna shoot the first morning duck. Then we're gonna have a little break and have a little breakfast, 10.30ish, come back out and shoot uh, rock pigeons. And then this afternoon at sunset, go shoot geese, which is a busy day of shotgunning, but it's all my favorite things. I mean, they're all challenging. Rock pigeons will they'll, they'll bring your A game. So it's a big day, but we're gonna end up tired. Good kind of tired, though. 
With the first hints of dawn still far in the east, Macris takes right. cover in a shooting blind not far from the river. And before he can even get settled in, the ducks are on the move. Out he goes. David, that was a one-shot double. <laughs> was it? Yep. Ah <laughs> I've got my Blazer F-16, and it's a, I shoot ducks with it back home, too, so it's a good duck gun. Down he goes. They come at you fast. That's David's duck, I think. Or is that one of the... That's your duck, sir. Oh, really? Oh, good. You know, a lot of our places in the U.S. are shooting decoying ducks. I mean, it's possible to have good pass shooting on ducks. We've just got water all around us, and they're moving from the river to these ponds and going back and forth. So it's one heck of a setup. And so you literally got ducks coming from the 360. They're not trying to land, they're trying to blow through. So my average goes down a little bit. But it's 40 shooting. That one's not going home tonight. Oh, wing tipped him. I t thanks, David. I tipped, I tipped that when I didn't catch up. I think this was the first time I've ever stood in the middle of the woods or the forest or the bush belt shooting ducks. Thank you, sir. It's ugly, but I'll take it. David Gardner and I are blind side by side, and we obviously had drawn the hot pegs, and it was unbelievably good fast shooting, almost hot gun shooting where you're shooting so fast your gun gets hot. I did. Thank you, sir. We have quite superlative duck shooting in the mornings, early, early mornings. Ducks like red bull teal, white-faced whistling ducks, those are the main species that we're shooting. Thank you. Coming around from the back bit, behind you. Coming over. Here come two. Here goes one. Oh, did you see that? This is like, it's like a fighter plane. They're coming over summit treetop, some high, a 360-degree angle, and it was about as fun as I've ever had on a duck hunt, just constant duck flying. And it also helps when I was actually hitting ducks pretty good. And David's a tremendous shot, and he was too, and we really had a great time. Coming around. There you go. Bird man allocated to each blind who helps pinpoint the fallen birds, which are then retrieved at the end of the shoot. What kind of duck? I think he's a whistling. Whistling, two whistling ducks. Beautiful green wing, big ducks. Good to eat? Yes. You like to eat them? Yes. Good. Thanks. On the duck shoots, we also work with an extremely confident, probably one of the finest gun dog handlers in this country, a man by the name of Slung Yun. He works with German shorthead pointers who are fabulous gun dogs, and they do a great deal of the retrieving at the end of the duck shoots. We are on an alfalfa field next to a pick cornfield. We're goose hunting. Get out here and get buttoned up and wait for them to come because geese are spooky. 
Not like those pigeons that just come in 140 miles an hour and say, what the heck, you can't hit me anyway. And they want us to let them come over. Don't shoot them coming in. Let them come over and get out here and shoot them. Now, the way the blinds are laid out, we're pretty much in an L shape, one through six over there and uh, seven through 12 on this side. But uh, that's OK, because we really don't have to worry too much about fields of fire, because the, uh, the keys will be flying high. So everybody's going to be pretty much shooting up like an anti-aircraft gun, trying to knock down these B-52 birds. Tough shot. They're going to do it. down. I had a double right opening up. Look at that. How about that? You gotta be kidding me. Oh, it's a perfect setup. Not a long afternoon of shooting. It's basically about an hour and a half, two hour thing right before the sun set, which is 545. So it's 430. I just pulled the trigger the first time. But that's not bad. Two nice Egyptian geese. First two barrels, Blazer speaks again. That's Egyptian goose, look at that. Pretty color. See the iridescent green? Three geese. And a lot of places back home I'd be done now. Well, the afternoon ended better than my pigeon shooting did. <clears throat> I got Three of the first four geese missed one, or hit one, but it hit him a little too far back. You're shooting on this line, and when somebody shoots, the goose just goes straight up in the air, and I shot behind. And I shot him, tried to put another one in him, but that's it. So it's been a good day. Look at that. Two Egyptian geese flying into the African sunset. Pieces of old Africa can still be found on the continent and Rovos Rail may be the most unique glimpse of them all. On the Rovos Rail wing shooting safari, guests travel much like the passengers on the Lunatic Express. But here, the destinations lead to days afield and Africa's great wing shooting. The final two days of the shoot are at a place called Camille. It's a really a tiny little siding on the rail line. It's literally a siding. The train stops there, and then the guests are taken from that siding by coach to a number of different varying farms where the ground operator has scouted the countryside really well, has a very good idea of where the guinea fowl are likely to be found on the appropriate time of any day. Our last couple of days, we did driven guinea fowl shoots. And when we arrived at the venue, the bird men are all dressed in uniform. They got their name and your name. And then all the beaters have flags and all their brightly colored gear. You, John, are a very lucky man. I'm Tony. Good to see you, I'm Tony. Good morning, Tony. Well, the beaters, as you see, they would stand sort of ready. That just just for, you know, just a little bit of a show off that they would be standing there. And as also the hunters can see that these are the beaters that will be working for them for the day. Kitimetsi, thank you. And then my wife uh, would uh, deal out the, the peg draws, which then everybody would take. We would then go, you would do uh, possibly four or five drives in the morning, and you would have lunch. 
and uh, after lunch we would normally do one or two more drives. They put out uh, lines of beaters who are basically farm laborers who are recruited to help with the shoots. They act as the beater and stop lines to guide the birds into the direction that is required to put them over the guns in really good flocks and small coveys of birds, providing fantastic shooting for the guns. Well, I'm on my peg, and we're waiting for the drive to start. It'll take a little while for the guinea fowl to get here, and then they'll get here kind of fast and furious and uh, see how we do. You know, I've been shooting the last past few days my Blonder F-16 on high volume pigeons and ducks and geese. But I wanted to switch to the Paradox gun for this driven shoot because even though it is a paradoxical gun, as Ross and I call them, it's a Holland Royal. And it's an English, you know, classic English side-by-side -side, uh, 12 gauge with two triggers. And that's what this is made for. I mean, it's this, you know, driven birds is ideal for this. So. He was smoking and burning and downwind and too far. David. The beaters are coming through the line, but they're wearing orange. They got flags. They're clapping their hands. And we have a blue sky rule here. You don't shoot anything below the tree line. You mind, you, you obey all those rules and nobody will have a bad day. Looks like that's the point they're crossing. Guinea fowl, for me, are challenging because it looks like a big chicken and it looks like a big yard bird of some sort. But he's flying 35, 40 miles an hour. And so he looks slow, and when you miss a guinea fowl, it's gonna almost always be behind. So I had kind of moments where I, I got, let's just say, into a lull. But luckily, I shook it off, and by the last day, the shooting was wonderful. Ah. They look larger than they actually are. At a distance, they have an appearance of being quite plump. But in flight, they are very strong flyers. A um, great deal faster than people imagine, so uh, you know, typically a great deal more lead is required. And they are also exceptionally tough birds. They take quite a lot of shooting. People underestimate how tough these birds are. But then bearing in mind that they live in an African environment, you know, with any number of different predators preying upon them, they are tough birds. Across big time. Ah! There was my double, I missed it again. Mm. I'm just shooting streaky. Open up strong, hit, 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 hit. I have a missing streak. Start whacking them again. A lot of birds came out that time. That's the most I've seen so far for one drive. That was great. Good stuff. A driven wing shoot is a challenge for both the hunter and the field marshal. Organizing scores of beaters and multiple shooting butts requires an almost military-like operation. But when it works, the guns are presented with fast flying guinea fowl ripping straight ah, toward them. Got both of those. Better day already. What we try and do is do different fields with different bush and landscape so that the birds aren't coming at the same angle and at the same height all the time. Otherwise, it sort of would become a little bit monotonous. There's three chaps helping me, professional hunters, which walk in the line. What is important in the line is to keep a straight line. The moment you have a line which starts zigzagging, 
the birds see the gaps and they go backwards. On the sides, how we keep them in, we have some tall red flags. So the birds see the flags and they stay in the area that we want them to be in. We check out the areas uh, at least five or six times before we do a hunt. It's wild birds we're shooting. So they could on any given day, you know, just decide to go somewhere else or be somewhere else or do something that you didn't intend. It is a big challenge, but when it all comes together like has happened these two days, you're very, very thankful that it's gone well and the clients have enjoyed their stay. Day two of the driven guinea fowl shoot finds Macris employing a method more commonly seen on the grand estates of England. By keeping a loader nearby with shells at the ready, Macris can almost double his speed with the blazer. And for this drive, he'll need all the speed he can get. The loading just speeds things up. So instead of having a dig in my pocket and put one hand on the gun, I can watch birds. I'm not looking down. Put two in there. They're coming fast. And then every time I shoot, I just break the gun and do that. And that way I'm looking at my next shot. Look at that, look at that. Just look at that. We're out on the line and the two guys that always shoot good, David and Walt, were on either side of me, and they were doing well. And then I had horsemen actually between me and David on the one side. And that line of four guns on that second drive just tore it up. And I mean, it was probably the best driven shooting I've ever seen for that many people in one row. We put a lot of birds on the ground that day. Faster you think they are. In the drive. Shot this bad boy hot. Uh, looks like a dozen, maybe more. Well done. I got two out in the trees there. Thank okay. you. In this was a quite a drive. Yeah, they didn't. You know, when they fall right at the top of that canopy, oh, okay. they don't come out. Okay. They're dead, but they're not oh, falling. So yeah. John's up there trying to get them. Okay. That was well done. Yeah. Thank yeah. you. Objective is really high quality shooting and a fabulous social experience, a, a great interaction amongst the guests, amongst the train staff, fabulous food. That is really what we're here for, to provide people with a memory and an experience that they will carry for the rest of their lives. So after the mornings open up on day two of the guinea fowl shoot, they had this huge lunch under the trees, and I mean, it was quite a spread. They had chafing dishes, and the local butcher came out and was serving beef fillets, lamb chops, sausages, and all kinds of salads, and just a stunning lunch. And it went on a bit long, and I think I figured out why it went on a bit long, is that we had put so many birds on the ground in the first three drives that they wanted to cool off a little bit and, and slow it down for the rest of the day. Because as I said, these are wild birds. You know, they're not stalking them. So you know how many birds you need to take out of each drive if you're gonna sustain a population. And guinea fowl are everywhere in Africa. They're very common, but it was responsible game management. And I think everybody was a little bit flattered that they shot so well they had to slow us down. Last drive of the afternoon, we had a really nice lunch in the shade of a tree. Makes a man sleepy. This is it, wind blowing in our face, so they'll be moving a little faster. Let's see what happens. It's already been a great day.
All right, there, the beaters just came through us, and they're gonna go through the other line that's on the other side of these trees. And when they do that, then we'll be done. But it's been a really good day. Almost every time that I've been in any camp in Africa, when you're getting ready to leave it, they will thank you in song. And so as we get through the last day's drive on the second day of the guinea fowl shooting, and the shooting on the train is over, we're headed back to Pretoria. The beaters and the birdmen all line up together and sing a number of songs that I've heard before in the Swana culture. They're thanking God Almighty for providing for them and leading the way. They're thanking us for coming to shoot with them. And it was, it was touching. It, was, it brings back old memories. Sometimes when you want to do something for a long time, you get to do it. It's not quite what you expected, or it doesn't quite turn out the way you think it would have or should have. I can say when I was pulling back into the station to the Voss family and the good people at Rovos, it exceeded my expectations. I was beyond happy, beyond fulfilled and content to have accomplished something that I wanted to do for a long time, to have had it all fall into place with other people that wanted to share it with you. It was stunning. I mean, truly stunning. And so my safari upon the Robo's Rail rose into the last station. It was here in Capitol Park, Pretoria, that I first embarked on this long-held dream.